Thank you so much for the privilege of the podium. I have no relevant disclosures. So today we're going to talk about the science behind prehabilitation, the role of nutrition in it, and prove to you its importance in surgery, going through the relevant work to date, and some methods that you can use in your clinics to enhance, enhance recovery and move it forward. So surgery is becoming more common. Our population is aging, it's becoming older and more complex, and an average of six surgical patients are going to happen to every person during their lifetime. Surgery is hard. There's a huge insult from it. It causes a metabolic response, catabolic response, and inflammation. With ensuing systemic changes, tissue trauma, quasi-starvation, and inactivity. In addition to a psychological impact, which can delay wound healing, compromise immunity, and cause a psychological distress that delays surgery and recovery. The extent and the duration of the stress response to surgery is related to the magnitude of the surgery and the risk of the person who's having the surgery. Their resilience to stressors is going to depend on multiple factors, including their age, their frailty, their chronic health status, including their nutritional status, and the presenting illness. Frail patients do worse in response to surgical stress. They can't compensate for the increased metabolic demand of surgery. They have physiologic deregulation at baseline, and this all results in increases in com complications, mortality, and poor overall outcomes from surgery, as well as increased costs and resources used. Now, age and frailty aren't the same thing, but they are inherently linked. And as patients get older, they have increases in their frailty index, decreases in their ability to respond to stress, decreases in their nutritional parameters, and that all leads to increased complications that they experience after surgery. Frailty is firmly associated with poor outcomes, and we need to identify the frail patients before surgery. This is especially true in cancer surgery and colorectal cancer surgery, where only 40% of patients are estimated to return to their baseline status after surgery. There's a very high rate of major complications, estimated at 30%, and this reduces not only functional capacity, but also their long-term survival and increases our health care expenditures. And the reality is we're getting better at doing surgery for cancer. We have better tools, better techniques, but this doesn't equate to better outcomes. So even though we can perform an oncologically sound, minimally invasive surgery on a patient, if that patient is frail, they're not going to recover well after surgery. Enhanced recovery protocols were aimed to target this. They are meant to um, enhance recovery, expedite patient's recovery after surgery, reduce complications, and reduce costs. We thought they were going to lead us into the promised land. But enhanced recovery protocols alone have us behind the eight ball immediately. The interventions primarily take place during surgery and after surgery. Patients unexpectedly can fail to recover well or comply with the protocols. And despite successful recovery, they still have the complication and reductions in functional capacity that we talked about. And surgeons may think that they're using enhanced recovery protocols, but less than half are actually implementing them well. So we need to improve value in surgery. We need to focus on improving our surgical and anesthetic techniques. We need to change when we are implementing these strategies. And we need to engage our patients better. And the paradigm that we can use in doing this is changing the shift from concentrating on patient recovery after surgery to before surgery. Before surgery, patients are in better physical condition. There's no concern to disturbing the wound healing process. Some patients may have long lags between neoadjuvant treatments and waiting times to surgery, and we can identify and modify the risks. We're not able to do this already after surgery. And when patients have surgery, it's equivalent to running a marathon. You wouldn't run a marathon without training, and you shouldn't have your patients go through surgery without training them for surgery. This is the concept of prehabilitation. It's preoperatively optimizing your patients and their functional capacity before surgery, which is the stressor, so that you can improve their outcomes after surgery. And these improvements can be objectively measured. This is the graph that you'll see again and again because it's transferable across all surgery service lines with prehabilitation. And you can also recognize that without prehabilitation, many patients never return to that functional level. It's a specific opportunity in high-risk patients to improve their outcomes, including patients with cancer and patients that are malnourished. 
In cancer care, it's different from other surgeries. There's an increased time interval from diagnosis to surgery, and many patients get treatments during that time period. There's a complexity of the surgical intervention itself, and the therapies that we use can also be toxic and have additional adverse events and effects on the patient. So with this, prehabilitation fits perfectly within that process of cancer continuum of care between the time of diagnosis and the beginning of the actual treatments. And it's also relevant after surgery because we monitor their long-term survival and their outcomes during that time. And here you can see that graphically. Before surgery with cancer patients, there's neoadjuvant treatments and wait times to the actual surgery. And that's an opportunity to modify risk factors for patients. Prehab is made up of several different elements, medical optimization, patient education, social support, lifestyle modifications, anxiety management and mindfulness, physical training, but nutrition is key. Nutrition is under-screened, under-diagnosed, and under-treated, but it's independently associated with morbidity, mortality, and increased costs in surgical patients. So this is something that we need to concentrate more on in our studies. The initial studies with prehabilitation were done by Carly and Zavorsky at McGill. And what the, what the authors did was perform a 12-week training program of aerobic exercise, strength training, and flexibility to see what the functional outcomes of patients would be after surgery. They found from this that patients had significantly better functional act activity, and they were insightful enough to say it was an intriguing concept that could have an enormous effect on reducing healthcare costs. Several studies have ensued. They then um, found that they compared their structured training regimen, which was cycling resistance training over a 12-week period with a simpler structured program of just walking and deep breathing exercises, and looked at patients' functional activity as well as their anxiety and depression levels. And they found that there was no significant difference between their heavily structured program and an easier program for patients to follow, and that there was poor compliance with the intense structured program as well. So it gives us hope that simpler programs can help patients. They then performed a randomized control trial to evaluate the effect of a trimodal prehabilitation program, <coughs> which includes a nutritional assessment with standard care. And here you can see that prehabilitation had a significant improvement in patients' functional outcomes after surgery. It improved their functional walking capacity Patients were restored to baseline versus conventional care at a rate of two to one, and that was durable after surgery as well. And we can see that this is transferable across surgery service lines. This is a recent study in JAMA looking at esophagastric cancer resections, where they also measured functional activity and improvements at baseline immediately before surgery and immediately after surgery. And you can see the same curves. The prehabilitation group had improved functional capacity both before and after surgery. The same group then determined if prehabilitation was better than straight rehabilitation for patients. And they found that prehabilitation was significantly better before surgery and after surgery. The prehabilitation group improved while they were waiting for surgery. The rehabilitation group declined in their functional status. After surgery, the prehab group was above baseline. The rehab group never even returned to baseline. And they saw that this was sustained after surgery. A different group then looked at the impact of prehabilitation just in the period waiting to go to surgery and not during the post-operative period, looking at changes in physical fitness with oxygen consumption and functional stepping stones uh, with neoadjuvant chemoradiation and locally advanced rectal cancer. So they looked at patients at baseline before neoadjuvant therapy, after neoadjuvant therapy, and then after surgery. They could see that in everyone, the neoadjuvant treatment reduced their oxygen consumption and their fitness levels, but there was improvement with the prehabilitation group after neoadjuvant therapy. Without that, the patients never returned to their functional baseline. And a recent study looking at high-risk patients undergoing abdominal surgery found that low, um, complication rates were independently lowered with prehabilitation. It's the first study to show that. So not just improvements in functional capacity and oxygen consumption, but actually complication rates were lowered by 50%. There's been multiple um, <coughs> randomized controlled trials um, with weak methodology, meta-analyses, and systematic reviews. 
and only a few of them have actually concentrated on the piece of nutrition in these studies. But what we can see from that is that nutritional prehabilitation alone decreases length of stay in complex patients by 2.2 days. That's significant. And when it's bundled with prehabilitation, it significantly improves the results of patients' functional capacities after surgery. So malnutrition is a real problem. Knowing that nutrition is important, we can also see that two-thirds of patients having surgery are malnourished postoperatively and preoperatively. Only one in 10 is actually diagnosed as being malnourished, and one in 100 is actually treated. And there are simple tools that we can use to screen these patients. What we know from the studies to date is that prehabilitation training is safe, feasible, and tolerable for patients. There is good evidence that it improves function and improves complications in high-risk patients. But there's questions we need to answer on exactly what elements to include, how to measure success, and how to attain patient buy-in. Because for patients, it's very confusing. We've just told them that they have cancer, and it's all a sea of what they're supposed to do next. Patients have different concerns than we do before surgery, especially in the state of nutrition about what to eat and what if they don't feel like eating. And we need to give them specific recommendations and personalized prescriptions in order to optimize them. There's multiple elements that go into prehabilitation, but as far as the nutrition, the question is, what exactly am I supposed to do? And some specific recommendations we can use. Um, you can do this right in clinic. It takes less than a minute to screen your patients for their nutritional status. It's asking three simple questions about BMI, unplanned weight loss, and if they've been eating less than 50% of their normal diet, as well as having a lab value of their albumin. If there's a yes to any of those questions, they're immediately qualified as a high-risk patient nutritionally. They should be referred for a formal nutritional assessment, and intervention should take place. But for all patients having major abdominal surgery, it is recommended that they have a week of immunonutrition. And these are packaged drinks that have arginine, fish oil, and high-protein content like Impact and Ensure Surgery. It's been shown that seven days of preoperative nutrition, even in low-risk patients, can decrease postoperative morbidity by 50%. For patients that are high risk that answer yes to any of those specific questions, it's recommended that they have high protein oral supplementation for at least seven days, with the goal of protein being 1.2 grams per kilogram per day. And total protein calories in these patients is more important than total calories. And then after surgery, for both low and high risk patients, it's recommended that they have immunonutrition for seven days and high protein intake with supplementation. And these guidelines were recently published. They're easy to access online, they're free, and they can help guide you with prehabbing patients for nutrition. So the success of prehab is gonna be centered on personalizing and individualizing it for your patient's risk assessment and their needs, using no or low cost technology to help implement it yourself and help your patients do it at home, and then giving them regular support. So to move Enhance recovery forward, it's important that you start before surgery. You can see that prehabilitation has clear benefits over rehabilitation, and nutrition is a critical piece in this. It's underdiagnosed, modifiable, and it directly impacts outcomes. So with these tools, hopefully you can implement some of these changes into practice for patients. That's it. Thanks. Thanks so much.